Welcome to another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. China's diplomatic, political, and economic activity is forever in the news. And certainly these past few days with the release of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels. China's reach now extends to Afghanistan with the withdrawal of the United States, as well as its ongoing activity in the Pacific, Africa, and other parts of Asia. So there's a lot to discuss, and we're pleased to have Dr. James Ferguson with us. He is a professor of political studies at the University of Manitoba. Welcome to the program, sir. Thanks, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here. So I guess my first question is, um, I'd love to know... Uh, what your, as you study China, as you do, what are your governing assumptions about the Chinese Communist Party's intentions and strategies? Like I'm talking like 30,000 foot level, you know, what, what's the, sort of their, their governing strategy, if you will? Well, that's a, a very important, but of course, a very difficult question. On one hand, there's no doubt that uh, China is a challenger to the existing international order. That's what everyone talks about, and certainly is the focus in Washington, to a lesser degree within the European Union and NATO, and even to a lesser degree in Canada. Uh, I wouldn't consider them to be an adversary per se yet, but they're sort of on the, the cusp of it. Uh, when you look from China, perspective and what the President Xi and the party has been saying, they have two big goals. One is shortly the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party. The second is in, in 2049, the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Their objective is to establish China as the dominant economic power and by default then the political power in the international system. If you step back a bit, though, I think what we're really looking at is uh, from a long perspective of Chinese foreign policy from Mao to the present, the Chinese see themselves partially in global great power or superpower terms, but also in terms that Asia, from if you like, from Afghanistan to the Asia Pacific region, is their sphere of influence. And they should be the dominant respected power and the rules of the game as they evolve, should be driven by Beijing, not by Washington or anyone else. So that's sort of the objective. I think we have to be very careful in differentiating between a global objective right. and what I think in reality is a regional one. Right. But their regional objectives do have a global impact, obviously. Yes, they do. Particularly when you take into account their multifaceted One Belt, Run Road initiative, the land road through the old Silk Road to gain it better access to the European market, uh, what's known as the String of Pearls, the Maritime Road from the South China Sea through into the Persian Gulf. And now the Chinese are also talking about the Arctic Road. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, with global warming, et cetera, there. So, of course, the regional ambitions have global implications. But I think we need to, to differentiate or be very careful about the global versus the regional. Because if you think in global terms, you're going to think more in a different ways than you think this is just a regional aspiration by right. part of the Chinese. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I mentioned the release of Meng Wanzhou and uh, the, the two Michaels. Uh, what, uh, what have you been saying about that? What are the lessons learned there? Well, the lessons learned, and I think it's reflective of Chinese diplomacy and their behavior over the past roughly half decade, if not more, is the Chinese are the view that they are a dominant power, uh, that they have to be recognized, uh, they need to be treated as such, and they're willing to use whatever instruments they have to ensure that their will is imposed on everyone else. Uh, I can't say I'm very, very much in agreement with the actions of the Canadian government on this uh, at all, uh, but now that it's over, uh, the key question is what now will Canada do? Right. And that's an issue for us. Sorry, you, you're not in agreement with how Canada handled it? How, how so? Well, basically, instead of standing up to the Chinese with rigorous policy decisions regarding Chinese investment in Canada, regarding the issue of Huawei, 
we sort of basically were passive about it. We right. left it in the hands of the United States to deal with the Chinese. And as it turned out, it was the United States who dealt with the Chinese for us. Um, and I can sort of understand partially the government, the Trudeau government's perspective on this. Uh, Huawei keeping that option open was sort of a carrot to the Chinese government. Hold on Didn't to that work, thought, but... uh, Doctor. We, we just have to take a brief commercial break. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here at the News Forum with Dr. James Ferguson. He is a professor of political studies at the University of Manitoba as we talk all things China. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, sorry I had to cut you off there with the commercial break, but do continue. I think you were talking about Huawei and, and that decision and uh, some of the things that the Canadian government was and wasn't doing. Well, I, th I think you can partially explain the passive response despite the rhetoric. And that's what the Canadian government, all, all they did with regards to the two Michaels and the Huawei issue was just rhetoric. And it was sort of, you could sort of understand as a carrot to the Chinese, to Beijing saying, listen, we are keeping the th these things open, but we want something from you. And that's something that now has to change. Now that the two Michaels are back, the main issue is resolved. I think Canada now needs to move forward and do something in a retaliatory sense. And the first step they should need to do is to basically tell Huawei, which Huawei is a private company, but we all know that Huawei is dependent upon the Chinese government, the Communist Party, uh, that you're out and to be consistent with our allies and all the other issues involved. So that's something that I expect, I would hope the government will do. And then following that, I think the government has to look at issues about Chinese investment in Canada. Uh, they're investing in natural resources, because they have certain resource problems. Uh, we have to be really concerned because China thinks economics in strategic political terms. Right. We think economics in economic terms, and that's a problem. So you think we should be uh, reviewing more of these transactions from the national security perspective then? Definitely. Not just thinking about them, but blocking. Mm. Uh, what the, the, of course, the government has implications about if the Chinese won't invest, who can get invest to deal with these companies which are up for sale, for example, but it doesn't matter. One has to bear this burden to send a clear message to China that as the United States will do and the Europeans have already started doing, saying that unless you come in line and behave the way we expect you to behave according to the rules of the trading and investment regime, the World Trade Organization, we're not gonna put up with this anymore. And, and I think it's important in this context to remember one thing, China is an export dependent country. Right. And that's one of their Achilles heels. Right. And it's not only uh, the EU and uh, US, but also Australia, a lot closer to China, but they've taken a hard line on this too, haven't they? Exactly. Australia, you think about the recent US, UK, Australia arrangement, although it's focused mostly on nuclear sub submarines, but that's for Australia, but it's really about a broader political message. You think about the Quad, uh, political relate, foreign policy, political relationship between India, Australia, uh, the United States and Japan. These are all messages being sent to Beijing that if you continue on the path that you've been on for the past several years, you're gonna face what the Soviet Union faced in the Cold War, right. containment. Right. And the, the peripheral countries around China who are deeply concerned about China, but of course are vulnerable, will increasingly start to lean more and more to the West. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about one of these other changes that has happened, and I, I, uh, I referred to it already, the victory of the Taliban in Afghanistan has led to an in a massive increase in Chinese influence. What can you tell us about that? It's hard to, to know, and again, looking at the, what's in the public press about this, uh, what that influence or the Chinese involvement in Afghanistan is really going to trace, translate into. Uh, first of all, I'm sure the Taliban government has clearly realized that given its uh, policies regarding democracy and women, uh, that aid from the West is going to be extremely difficult and problematic. And they're not ones who I think are going to bend to this. So China is an option. The Chinese agreement, as far as we know, with the Taliban government is that the Taliban have agreed they will not mess around with the Uyghur population in the Xinjiang 
I don't know how you pronounce that, province. Yeah. So you have sort of a marriage of convenience. And of course, important in terms of the one belt, road, one road, the Silk Road uh, area. And I know a lot of people thinking this then leaks, links to China, to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, and then Tehran. But I would be very cautious about that because there's one state they're not talking about, and that's Russia. Russia has significant interest in the region. Uh, China's penetration in Afghanistan has implications for the various stands, Kazakhstan, et cetera. Uh, the, the Russians are not going to be keen about increasing Chinese influence in Afghanistan. We're going to have to take another quick break, but we'll be back with Dr. James Ferguson after that break. Please stay with us. And we're back here at Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, with Dr. James Ferguson, professor of political studies at the University of Manitoba, talking about uh, China. Uh, and uh, Jim, uh, Chinese leaders have pretty well explicitly stated that U.S. influence in the world is waning, that it's time for Chinese global leadership. Is China up to this challenge? It's not easy being the world's cop or being uh, sort of in charge of international multilateral organizations. Uh, are there some downsides for China on this? There are several downsides for China on this. First of all, the question is, is anyone going to believe them? And what would Chinese leadership look like? Uh, if you go back over the history of the People's Republic, from Mao on forward to Deng Xiaoping and the subsequent leaders to Xi, uh, the, the sense of China has always been we are an example of revolution, a revolution of government which will enhance development. In a way, the message they tried to send the developing world was if you want to develop, it's the Chinese model. And that's sort of what the implicit message, message they're trying to send. Right. But their behavior, in fact, has been entirely opposite. It's been exploited. Uh, the value of Chinese investment, for example, in, into Africa, uh, with no strings attached, was very positively uh, received by the Africans. But over time, they found that there are strings attached, and these are Chinese interests. The United States, the West still remains a global message. And this idea that the United States, the West is waning, is a real problematic one. We've heard it for decades. I mean, go back, for example, to the 60s, that the US was declining, didn't happen. We go back to the 80s, when Japan was supposed to be the next great superpower, didn't happen. We're back at it again. There is an embedded strength in the US and the West, the liberal democratic and universal principles which gives us, the West, if you will, an advantage which the Chinese don't have. And I don't think from what their behavior, and if you think about their own actions, for example, in the South China Sea and elsewhere, that this is something that they can really export. They'll have short-term wins, but long-term, they have real great problems and challenges to face. Interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about supply chains. Uh, Clearly, this is an area now of superpower competition. Uh, can you describe the state of play now as you see it? Well, I think the state of play in terms of supply chains, and I think it's a really important question, is if you think of, and again, let me emphasize, I'm not an economic expert. I'm not an economist. I'm a politics guy. But if you think of the corporate motives to invest significantly in China uh, for cost reasons, uh, and then develop that supply chain. What we found, of course, certainly during the pandemic, is that we've had a significant problem with plant supply chains. Right. And this is compounded by the geopolitical situation between the West led by the United States and China. And the message I think that is going out implicitly, if not explicitly, and again, it's not coming from the Canadian government, but I think the American government is a little more clear, and the Europeans are more clear, Huawei is a good example, is that you better rethink your supply chain. Uh, there are a lot of alternatives out there in East Asia, Southeast Asia in particular. There are alternatives in Africa, which can provide the benefits. And politically, you've got to face the potential problem that the governments will shut you down. 
And I think the message that's being sent implicitly to corporations is rethink this, start to think about relocating to other cheap labor areas, which can be efficient and effective, uh, which are more in line with West, the West, uh, than staying with China. And that's a nightmare, I think, for the Chinese. And it's a problem compounded by their aggressive and what I would call clumsy diplomatic behavior. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, obviously, we've seen President Biden move very swiftly to review U.S. supply chains. So what, what do you think the Canadian government should be doing on this? We should be following suit. We should be looking very closely and uh, arranging high-level meetings with corporate executives in Canada and making it very clear to them that you need to rethink how you do these things. Uh, and particularly, I mean, I understand com- corporations have sunk investments in China. You can't walk away from them, but your new investments have got to move elsewhere. I th- and the government has to become more focused and active uh, and present in the issue of our relations with China uh, rather than living in the past. And we're, Canada's living in the past. We're still focused on Europe. We still look east. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. We're here with Dr. James Ferguson, Professor of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Jim, um, you were just getting into, uh, I guess, basically a plea for the Canadian government to be more uh, more with their eyes open when it comes to uh, China and uh, our economic and political survivability. So I guess my question that flows out of that uh, conversation was, what expectations do you have of the newly elected Trudeau Liberals uh, when it comes to uh, these kinds of issues? Very little, unfortunately. Sadly, if you like. Uh, there's nothing in the Trudeau track rever- record besides rhetoric. And we're great with rhetoric, Canada. And of course, part of the rhetoric is talking about being in line with our allies. But there are numerous issues where we're not in line with our allies. Uh, Canada has to, and for a long time, and and in many ways, for most of the history of Canadian foreign policy, the dominant, and this is independent of the political stripes of governments, governments have tended to think foreign policy is economics, Mm -hmm. trade opportunities, investment opportunities. Uh, What they've forgotten is all those things flow from the political relationships. And there's nothing in the record, and I hope I'm wrong, but there's nothing in the record of the Trudeau government beyond rhetoric, I mean, it loves to say things, uh, that they're actually going to take some hard steps. Mm. And that's what this government needs to do. It needs to get in line with our allies. Uh, and it's not because we're dependent upon our allies or subservient to them. It's because our interests are in the same as our allies. They're the same as the United States. They're the same as the Europeans. And we need to move in lockstep with them. And the recent U.S. to U.K. Australian agreement is a clear example of where Canada has been left out. Indeed. Uh, Canada has to turn west and start to think about the west. The U.S. is obsessed, obsessed with the China question. Right. Russia's still there. And where are we? It's as if uh, it's just one of many minor problems for us. Mm. And that's a grave political error. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it, this uh, AUKUS uh, agreement was uh, announced uh, at the tail end of the election campaign, so I wouldn't necessarily expect it to be a big focal point for candidate Trudeau, but that's over now, and it's clear uh, we're kind of on the outside looking in, which is, that's a geopolitical issue, but it also, in a sense, makes us more vulnerable to Chinese pressure, does it not? Potentially, it does. Uh, we might be viewed in Beijing as a bit of an anomaly that can be exploited. Uh, and rather than being firm with the Chinese saying, we're not an anomaly, you cannot exploit us. We're part of the Western group. We have common interests. We need to be involved uh, and, and make this clear to the government in Beijing. I mean, in, Beijing, in Beijing's world, of course, Canada is not very important to them. The U.S. is the key thing for them, and Russia and the EU and uh, uh, primarily. But nonetheless, we're 
even though we're not very important, we're still an important element in this. And where we stand on this is very important in sending a consistent, coherent message to Beijing. Change your behavior. I don't think anyone in Canada or the United States anyways has any objections for China growing as an economic actor, as an economic power, providing better goods and wealth to its citizens of a higher standard of living. We're all agreed. We have no problems with that. Uh, it's the way you're going about it is the problem. Change your behavior. Things will work out. Don't, and things aren't going to work out for you. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, Dr. James Ferguson, thanks for joining us uh, here on Boom and Bust to having a, a very fulsome conversation about the People's Republic of China and its influence on Canadian economics and politics and basically also world economics and politics. It's something that we'll have to keep watching. So we appreciate your wisdom and your advice, sir. Anytime. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Dr. James Ferguson, Professor of Political Studies, University of Manitoba. Very interesting conversation about uh, the economic, uh, diplomatic, and political challenges that Canada has uh, with the People's Republic of China. Even after the release uh, of the two Michaels, uh, the issues don't go away. In fact, uh, they become more acute in a lot of ways. So this is going to be affecting uh, jobs, our economy, uh, our ability to grow, all of these things. We will continue on this issue, but thanks for watching today.